Stefan was young, handsome, eloquent, and also an artist. He was an orphan under the guardianship of his dead father's brother, his uncle Wilhelm, in whose house in Brunswick, Germany, he had been brought up from a little child. Being young, handsome, eloquent, and enthusiastic, he was much loved by all around him, but in particular by his cousin Gertrude, whom he swore he loved in return. Or he had believed it when he first swore his love for Gertrude, but the sentiment had worn out in his cold and selfish heart. At the age of 19, Stefan had just returned from his apprenticeship to a great painter at Antwerp, and he and Gertrude had wandered together, at sunset, by moonlight, and in the bright and joyous morning, in the beautiful dream of their passionate romance. They had kept it a secret from Wilhelm, who had the father's ambition of a wealthy suitor for his only child, a cold and dreary vision compared with Gertrude's love for Stefan. The pair became secretly betrothed one twilight when Stefan placed a ring on Gertrude's finger and they swore to be true to each other forever and ever through trouble and danger, sorrow and change, in wealth or poverty. The ring was a peculiar one, a massive golden serpent, its tail in its mouth, the symbol of eternity. It had been Stefan's mother, and he would know it amongst a thousand. Even if he became blind, he could select it from a thousand by touch alone. Now that they were betrothed, they agreed that death alone could part them. But Gertrude's father needed to be one to consent to their union. Stefan swore that he would return from the grave to be with Gertrude, and that if she passed before him, she would also return, and again her fair arms would be clasped around his neck. To this she replied that it was only lost souls who had taken their own lives, who were compelled to return to the troubled earth and haunt the footsteps of the living. They had been betrothed a year when Stefan again had to leave, this time for Italy, on a commission for some rich man to copy Raphael's and Titian's in a gallery at Florence. He had gone to earn an income and perhaps win fame, but was still missed by Gertrude and Wilhelm, who believed that his daughter's sadness was no more than a cousin would feel. Over the weeks and months, Stefan wrote, often at first, then seldom, and at last, not at all. Gertrude invented excuses to herself, often visiting the distant post office where his letters arrived, often hoping, only to be disappointed, then despairing, only to hope again. But real despair set in for good when a rich suitor appeared on the scene and her father became determined that she was to marry at once fixing the wedding date as the 15th of June. It was the middle of May, so there was still time for a letter to reach Stefan in Florence, for him to return, take Gertrude away and marry her, despite her father, despite the whole world. But the days and weeks flew by, and he did not write or return. On the 14th of June, she went to the little post office for the last time, and again heard the dreary answer, no, no letter. With tomorrow the day appointed for her bridal, her father and suitor staunch in their intent, it was her last day to employ as she would. She took a different path from that which led home, out to a lonely bridge where she and Stefan had often stood watching the sunset sink upon the river. Stefan had received Gertrude's letter, blotted with tears, entreating, despairing, but he was at that time bewitched by an artist's model, and Gertrude was half forgotten. Besides, art was his eternal bride, and he had no wish to fetter himself with a wife. The foolish vows of his boyhood forgotten, he delayed his journey to Brunswick, planning to arrive when the wedding was over. So, on the 15th of June, he entered Brunswick by the very bridge on which Gertrude had stood the night before. His sketchbook under his arm, and accompanied by his large dog, 
Stefan stopped to draw objects that attracted him. The crag opposite, weeds and pebbles in the river, a group of willows in the distance. Then a group of figures, not a funeral, as there were no mourners, but where a draped form was being carried on a crude frame by bearers who were fishermen. The men formed a perfect group when they rested their burden on the riverbank and sat down, and Stefan began to sketch a hurried outline. Eventually he joined the men and inquired if they were carrying a body. Yes, they replied, a lovely young woman who had drowned, washed ashore an hour ago. Of course, the artist wished to draw the lovely corpse and gave the men some money to remove the rough sailcloth they had used to cover her. Shining up at him but lifeless lay the face which was once the light of his uncle's home and his own younger life, that of his cousin Gertrude, his betrothed. And on the third finger of the left hand was the golden serpent ring that had been his mother's the ring which, if he were to become blind, he could select from a thousand others by touch alone. Stefan's first thought was of flight, away from Brunswick, that hideous river, anywhere away from remorse, to forget. He and his dog Leo walked for miles before he was even aware of what he was doing, before he was finally able to sit by the roadside and compose himself. While he sat the stagecoach approached, and remembering that it went to Aix-la-Chapelle in the west, Stefan hailed it and sprang on board. The whole night he sat there, stunned and sleepless, but when other passengers awoke in the morning, joined in the conversation, talking and laughing boisterously. An older passenger near him opened the carriage window and told him to put his head outside. Stefan later remembered the fresh air and the roadside reeling before his eyes before he fell in a lifeless heap on the carriage floor. The fever kept him for six long weeks on a bed at a hotel in Aix-la-Chapelle. On recovering, he and Leo set out by foot for Cologne, Stefan feeling his former self once more, singing and sketching along the way, his drowned cousin forgotten. In Cologne he felt happy, standing absorbed in the beauty of the great cathedral, when suddenly someone or something from behind him put two cold arms around his neck and clasped its hands on his chest. He turned quickly around. There was no one and only his shadow on the flagstones. Although he felt, he could not see the cold arms clasped around his neck. The embrace was not ghostly, for it was palpable, but not real, for it was invisible. He tried to throw off the cold caress, grasping the hands to tear them away, feeling cold, wet fingers, and, on the third finger of the left hand, the ring, which was his mother's, the golden serpent, the ring he always said he would know among a thousand by touch alone. In a panic, Stefan called to Leo, and the dog leapt to his shoulders, its paws on the dead hands. But Leo then uttered a terrific howl and sprang away from his master. The dead arms were still around Stefan's neck when a watchman, alarmed by the howling of the dog, came into the square to see what was wrong. In a breath, the cold arms were gone. From then on, Stefan tried never to be alone. He made a hundred acquaintances and shared the chamber of another student. If left by himself in the public room of the inn where he stayed, he would run into the street. People noticed his strange actions and began to think he was mad. In spite of all, he was alone once more when one night... The public room was empty and he strolled out to find an empty street. For the second time, he felt the cold arms around his neck and again Leo shrank away from him with a piteous howl. Stefan left Cologne, walking with travelling hawkers and labourers and sleeping in the inn's kitchens by night, but he was often alone 
and it was now common for him to feel the cold arms around his neck. Many months later, his money nearly gone and his health broken, Stefan neared Paris, which he would reach at the time of the carnival. In Paris, he need never surely be alone and may even recover his lost gaiety, his health, resume his profession and once more earn fame and money by his art. At last, the million voices of Paris would exorcise his phantom. In Paris, he found the opera house where there was a masked ball and hired a costume to throw over his shabby dress. He was soon in the midst of the wild gaiety at the opera house ball, shouting and dancing in the mad crowd with a lovely Parisienne hanging on his arm. His old light-heartedness was surely coming back, while, strangely, he heard people around him talking of the outrageous behaviour of a drunken student and pointing at him. But he had not had a drink since yesterday at noon. Oddly, to him his voice was sounding thick and hoarse, his speech indistinct. The small Parisienne was wearied out, her arm resting on his shoulder heavier than lead, and the other dancers, one by one, dropped off. The lights in the chandeliers and glimmering lamps died out as cold grey light from the newborn day crept in through half-opened shutters and the brightness was gone from the eyes of his fading companion. He was alone in that vast saloon with no music save that of his beating heart. The cold arms were around his neck, whirling him around, their icy grasp inescapable, still invisible and bearing his mother's ring. Stefan found he had no power to shout, his dancing footsteps the only sound echoing in the empty hall as he surrendered himself to the cold hands clasped on his chest. The lights all now out, half an hour later the gendarmes came in to see that the house was empty followed by a great dog they found seated howling on the steps of the theatre. Near the main entrance, they stumbled over the body of a student who had died from lack of food, exhaustion and the breaking of a blood vessel.